here at the uh, 2017 ASC conference and uh, my name is Sean Bushway. I am a professor at the University of Albany and I am delighted to uh, be here with Phil Cook who is a um, just recently retired from Sanford School at the University at Duke University. He is a uh, 1973 graduate of the University of California at Berkeley uh, in economics uh, and he spent 44 years at Duke University at uh, what was initially a, a small institute of some type uh, that eventually grew into the Sanford uh, School uh, and he had played a very important role in uh, developing that school, leading that school at two different times um, and uh, was, I was privileged to be at the uh, Festriff in his honor at retirement in, in, uh, in, in April um, where he was honored for a lifetime of scholarship on bad behavior which is probably the greatest title of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a career that you could ever possibly hope to have. Um, and uh, in addition to his, his, his founding uh, work in public policy at Duke, um, he's been a longtime leader in criminology. He's a fellow of the Academy of the Experimental Criminology and a fellow of the American Society of Criminology. Um, he's probably in criminology best known for his work in deterrence, supply and demand for crime, employment and crime and gun control. Outside of uh, criminology, he's also well known for his work um, primarily in what you might call vices. I tend to think of things we like to do that probably aren't, that aren't always good for us. Uh, lotteries, gambling, uh, tobacco, uh, alcohol. And, and he, he thinks about these things from an economic perspective. Uh, he also has done some work in education. Um, also done some work on just sort of thinking about how markets are organized. Uh, so he's had a very full career on in many different dimensions, and uh, we're delighted. I'm delighted to be able to uh, talk to you today about your uh, long career. Yeah, thank you, Chuck. Um, so this is kind of fun because uh, we're both from outside of Buffalo. We're in the eastern suburbs of Buffalo. Uh, uh, there are no western suburbs of Buffalo. For those of you who don't know Buffalo tomography, there's a lake on the west side, so it's either northeast, south, or east. And we're both from the eastern suburbs of Buffalo. And I was just curious, just to talk a little bit about growing up in, in Clarence uh, and uh, what life was like before you headed off to Michigan and studied in economics. Sure. Um, Clarence uh, was a small, kind of half rural community that our single claim to, uh, to fame was that we did have a stop on the New York Thruway. So, other than that, it was hard to say. But it was a good place to grow up. Uh, my parents bought a farm when I was four years old, and uh, so uh, as a few years later, uh, they bought a cow. And uh, some people think the most remarkable fact about me is that I know how to milk a cow by hand. And, uh, how many criminologists can say that? Um, and that, that turned out to be relevant to my subsequent career because uh, Millie gave so much milk that we were uh, able to sell it to neighbors and the result was a substantial college fund which helped me through Michigan and, uh, and thereafter. Um, my father was an industrial chemist uh, and my mother was uh, primarily a homemaker and, and a community leader but both of them dreamed of being college teachers and both of them ended their careers as college teachers. Uh, so it, it, I come to this uh, project naturally. I certainly heard about it a lot when I was growing up uh, as being the best of all careers. Uh, you know, so I uh, think benefited from a, a remarkably good school system that we had in Clarence. I don't know what your experience was, but I... We were there, I was a, two towns down, so Iroquois. Yeah, so yeah. It was about the same, probably. Uh-huh. Kind of similar rural, a little bit of rural, a little bit of suburban. Yeah, and, and it was a small pond, uh, and uh, that benefited me, so I, I was um, able to distinguish myself within that setting uh, along the way, whereas otherwise it would have been easier to get lost. Uh, but I look back on it and, and think um, that it was a good place to grow up uh, and uh, the, uh, my parents uh, prepared me well for uh, my career and, and the, uh, I guess the joke is that if you start your life in Buffalo then everywhere else 
it looks like a better climate, and uh, it really uh, turned out to be true. <laughs> the um, one of the things that came out of your fest trip, you had, a, you had some brothers that have done some interesting things as well. You mind talking a little bit about your brothers? Yeah, I have three older brothers, and so that's what my mother was up to uh, all those years. I was um, ra raising the four sons, uh, and um, each successful in, in our own and separate ways. My uh, one brother, who became an academic, Steve Cook, is still at the University of Toronto in the Computer Science Department. And he won the Turing Award uh, a while ago, which is awarded every other year, and it's the equivalent of the uh, Nobel Prize in computer science. Um, so that uh, relationship kept me humble. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, um, so how did, tell, tell us a little bit about how you got to Michigan, and, and how, why you chose to go to Michigan of all places, and, and, and uh, why did you choose economics? Yeah, Michigan was a family tradition. Uh, my parents uh, met there when they were both in graduate school there. Uh, my mother, in fact, had grown up in the state of Michigan on the, on the thumb, and that remained the place where we got together for reunions after that until very uh, recently. Uh, so uh, there was never any question that Michigan was on the short list of places that I should go. And, it uh, seemed like a, a good value for the, for the money. My, two of my brothers went there and had a, a very rewarding experience, and I have never regretted going there. I got admitted to the honors program and uh, was able to uh, hang out with an extraordinary group of people, uh, including uh, Judy who I met the first day that I arrived there <laughs> and uh, started date, dating a few months later and ended up marrying. So. so did you marry her while you were still in school? Yes, uh, we married the uh, summer after our sophomore year. Oh, cool. And, yeah, things have changed since then, but uh, in those days, uh, people uh, as already as undergraduates were thinking about settling down one way or another, and uh, that was on my mind. I have to tell you, I was sort of, as a Notre Dame grad, I was having some trouble with the idea. We're going to have to talk about Michigan during this talk, but <laughs> yes, <laughs> <I'm> yeah. <laughs> uh, but I, I got over it. Um, uh, but Ann Arbor is a pretty cool place. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But you know, it, I arrived at Michigan with the thought uh, that I was going to be a math major, like my big brother, and, and uh, I thought I was pretty hot stuff when it came to math. And one of the great things uh, about going to a big university like Michigan is how quickly you lose your illusions about your relative standing. <laughs> and so what I discovered there was uh, that there are, is this group of people who are math geniuses and that I was not one of them. And, and so what was the point uh, of pursuing that? Uh, fortunately, my sophomore year, I took my first economics course, and uh, it was love at first sight or love at first class. Uh, it certainly took advantage of, of a, a more mathematical logic that I was attracted to, uh, but it also engaged with you know, real-world problems and it seemed to have a lot of solutions to those problems. So, anyway, I, I uh, found it to to be a natural calling, although I had no idea uh, when I first arrived there as a freshman. Uh, I ended up uh, working with a couple of the faculty at the University of Michigan, and, and uh, that was further inspiration. And then I wrote a senior thesis on a topic that was inspired by Gary Becker's work on on-the-job training, uh, the first of several projects I've done inspired by Gary Becker. Have you ever met Gary? Yes, yeah, I have. What's it like to, to, to what was it like to meet him? I mean, he was... So just brief aside, <laughs> before I tell you who Gary Becker is, Gary Becker is the founding economist who, the Nobel Prize winning economist who first started talking about the economics of crime. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably, it's a foundational person in that area, but he's not only economics of crime, he's a number of other sort of, probably most well known for applying economics to non-traditional topics. Exactly. But yeah, he's yeah, yeah. but he's also also 
wrote for years and years and years uh, sort of common uh, explanations of economics to in sort of popular magazines. I can't remember if it was Times or Newsweek or whatever it was, but he's very accessible uh, uh, sort of description of economics. Yeah. No, I mean, very approachable, uh, kind of down the earth guy. He uh, uh, gave a talk at, at Duke while I was there, and at, uh, I met him once at the University of Chicago, but uh, very approachable. Uh, and, you know, for all my uh, intellectual conflicts with him, which I suspect he never noticed. <laughs> I was just thinking about that, actually. <laughs> I found him uh, at a personal level to, to be a delightful person. I mean, so, cause that was kind of interesting, right? Because in you know his thing was 1968. By 1979, you basically it's in your article in Crime and Justice, you basically said you thought most of the large premises of his theory were wrong, um, and that you know that was fairly bold at, at some level to say these things. Yeah. Well, I mean, he he was of course Gary Becker and bulletproof. So. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Uh, but I, th I think that it, it's interesting in terms of uh, a new field that it gets started that the initiators uh, rightfully get a lot of credit, e even if they didn't get it right. Uh, and so I, I think that Gary Becker was an inspiration to the immediate subsequent generation. So you graduated from Michigan in what year? I graduated in 1968. Yeah, so, the, so your work on with Gary Becker was pr kind of preceded at the time when he actually wrote. Is it, I mean, because his the, the prime crime article is 68, right? It's did yes. he had, had he written about crime before that? Not that I'm aware. So, you, so no. you weren't. So the stuff your your early exposure to him had nothing to do with crime. It was all about human capital issues and uh, and on a job training and, and education and all the rest of it. So that's. Um, what I was following and as an undergraduate I, I actually was uh, to the extent that I concentrated it was in labor economics. So where did your interest in crime come from? Is that was it already there at, at, at college or is it did sort of developed later? Uh, I was interested in bad behavior from the time I was 12 or 13 I think. <laughs> <laughs> and I got a certain um, amount of field experience uh, to, to the extent that Clarence allowed for that <laughs> kind of thing but uh, no, it, it, is this where you have to talk about cow tipping? <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> um, the the, uh, the fact was that it didn't occur to me to, to write a dissertation on crime until probably my fourth year at Berkeley. And, and you went to Berkeley right after college? Directly, yeah. Okay. Uh, and I had the great fortune of uh, connecting with Daniel McFadden while I was there, uh, who just recently won a Nobel Prize in economics, uh, but at that time was in his early 30s and, and getting started on some projects that later made him famous. Um, and he just took me under his wing and uh, basically said that I could work on anything that I wanted to and he would support me. So, uh, a very light hand. So when it came time to write a dissertation, it was natural to write it under his direction. Uh, and I had two ideas. One was to write on the Phillips curve, the, the trade-off the, between inflation and unemployment. Uh, I had some good ideas about that and a way of pursuing it. Um, and then the other idea I had was to write about parolee recidivism because I had happened on this uh, a stash of data that nobody had used um, on parolees and their work experience uh, and what eventually happened to them. Uh, so there was a horse race in my mind and McFadden said whatever so I ended up writing um, about parolee recidivism uh, and understand that I had never taken a course in criminology had no particular knowledge or understanding of the criminal justice process. Um, what I did bring to the table was uh, a lot of kind of technical know-how because I had spent my time at Berkeley taking statistics and math courses and, and this interest in labor economics. 
that I dutifully went over to the uh, criminology department at Berkeley uh, and found some young professor there who was willing to talk to me. I tried out my idea for a dissertation topic, which was to write on the effect of labor market opportunities and the chance of, uh, that the, the parolee would, would go straight. Uh, and he told me that my topic was of absolutely no interest. Uh, but the only interesting question was why society chooses to define some people as criminal and others not, and that I should be looking at those bigger structural issues instead of fussing about the minutiae of parolee recidivism. So I ignored him and went back and, and wrote my dissertation. When I was hired at Duke in the public policy, it was partly with the idea that somehow I had become a criminal justice expert and I was put to work teaching um, a, a seminar on, on the administration of criminal justice. Fortunately, um, I was teamed up with a law professor and with the local district attorney. So the three of us taught the course together and my job was to referee between the two of them to keep them from just tearing each other's throats up because they, they were at odds about most everything. But it was incredibly informative for me. Uh, so that was my real course in criminology, was listening to these two guys. The, um, so one of the things that's kind of fun when you get to know you is, and I've been lucky enough to know you for a long time now, but is, is your, you know, you learn pretty quickly about Judy who you mentioned already from Michigan. Um, what did she think as you started, you know, as you're choosing between the Phillips curve and a very traditional economics career right. and, and sort of this crazy policy economics thing, which is much less formed, how did, wh where did she play and how did she think about that and how did she help you think about this choice you were making, which had a, you know, luckily for those of us who study crime, that's had a huge impact on our area, but clearly affected your career in pretty important ways. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think Judy, like like Dan McFadden, really didn't care what I wrote on as long as I wrote something and got done with it. <laughs> I mean, she, she was ready to move on and, and start her own career, which was in, uh, eventually a PhD in clinical psychology at Duke. Uh, but she had been gracious enough to step aside while I did my graduate work and she raised the babies. So that's uh, what it turned out. Uh, she also was a great support during the, the dark years of my graduate education, which were the fourth and part of the fifth year. Uh, and I think a lot of doctoral students had the same experience, that somehow when you're doing coursework at the, the first couple of years, you're caught up in lab, you know what you're supposed to be doing, and it, it's a uh, clear uh, direction. But um, when it comes time to write the dissertation, and it's just you and, and your keyboard, uh, and trying to figure out um, what to do and, and what to do uh, to fill the days in order to make progress on this, it can be discouraging. Uh, so I had serious thoughts at the time about quitting graduate school and becoming a carpenter or who knows what. Um, and uh, fortunately for me, I don't know about the field, but for me, I, I got over that. And you had two kids at the time, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, that was a good reason to get a real job. <laughs> 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 yeah, absolutely. I think at the fest trip, there was a great picture of you with the, on the floor with the kids, mm -hmm. with long hair. And mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very Berkeley looking. Right, right. right. Uh, it, 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 it's somewhat... I guess it's both heartening and disheartening to hear that you went through that in grad school because I certainly did. But I mean, yeah, you know, the, you know, you had a didn't you basically have a paper in AR by the time you were in grad school? I mean, near the end of grad school, you'd gotten a paper. Yeah, I I wrote American uh, Economic Review a paper called the, uh, the a one line proof of the Slutsky equation, um, which in some circles is still my most famous publication. Uh, you know, that there are actually cohorts of students who grew up learning the Slutsky equation from this paper. And so that 
but they have a high, hard time connecting me with the person I am now. Um, and, but the, this was an entirely, this was a mathematical exercise uh, back in the days when I, um, I was still doing math on a regular basis. Uh, and so that came out in 1972. I didn't graduate until the following year. Right. Uh, but there's not that many, I mean, first of all, in economics people don't publish, and they certainly didn't publish back then, right. um, prior to grad, finishing grad school. So there'd be a graduate student uh, had a paper that's getting published in American Economics Review, which is the top journal in economics, uh, prior to finishing grad school. I, I had to feel somewhat good. Yes, I, I think it, um, it, it certainly was helpful. And when I got on track with the, the much larger project, I should say the paper in the American Economic Review was happenstance. Um, I was a TA for uh, the graduate theory course, and I was preparing my notes for my section meeting, and I started playing around with the algebra uh, and discovered some new and simpler way of demonstrating. So I went into the student lounge and, and met one of the young faculty members there and I said, hey Steve, look at this, what do you think? And he said, well, you got that one calculation wrong, but otherwise it looks right, and said, why don't you send it to the AER? And so that was uh, like a one-day wonder for a one-page proof. What I love about that story, besides it just being incredible, is that you know it sort of, in a lot of ways, defines your work in the sense that I, when we talk about you outside, behind your back, the other thing that we always talk about is like how you distill things down to the essence. It's like find the you know if you're thinking about researching like Phil Cook, find the thing that 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 tells the story in a picture. Tell find find the way to get you know get the get the story down really simple and really clear and test it in the most clear way possible. Yeah. And it, and, it, and the fact that you came up with a one line proof for something that used to have what four pages. Um, it's sort of a, a pretty telling description of, of what you do really well that a lot of us admire. Yeah, well thank you, Sean. I, no, it is true that the standard proof at the time uh, would take upwards of 45 minutes on the blackboard. Those were the days when the professor would stand up with a piece of chalk and write algebra line after line on, on the blackboard. And I remember that lecture. So I did a lot of graduate students after me a big favor. Doing this. I, I, I remember that lecture. I did not understand it. I went <laughs> fast. <laughs> uh, I, I, I got lost a little bit when we got to the, uh, the mathy part of microeconomics. But, but I, I like this idea, of the theme of simplicity, which uh, I think is an important one, and it's an important one for certainly for students who are thinking about what direction to take. But, you know, in the early days when I was studying economics and, and then doing it, uh, the way you demonstrated that you were smart would be to, to develop elaborate mathematical models and, and use um, complex estimation schemes like three-stage least squares or something. And, you know, what that demonstrated, I think, is that you had spent too much time, you know, uh, studying uh, econometrics, and that you know you were had a certain kind of intelligence that you were able to, and, and that that became the basis for people believing your result. But what I found uh, often in, in lectures on articles that had that feature to them, the, this kind of extraordinary complexity, was that it was the first five minutes that either sold the idea or didn't. And the first five minutes was often just an intuitive story of some kind uh, that didn't have any algebra, didn't have any numbers, but it was. Uh, and and economists, in fact, would ask each other, "Well, what's your story?" And the story was the elevator talk. It, it was the five minutes. And so the question is: Is there some way to refine that and, and make that into a more scientific? One of the payoffs is marketing and being able to sell your ideas. Yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit about some of the work. You're, it's a little daunting to look at your career because you've done so many things. Um, but one of the areas that I think is really exciting and interesting that maybe is a little less well known is the work you've done on private inputs. Mm -hmm. The idea that um, uh, people, so that you 
you've thought a little bit about supply and demand for crime, which is an interesting way of thinking about it, but that thinking about the, um, the private inputs to the crime control or crime prevention part. And um, you're sort of famous for saying that we, we spend far more money on the private side than on the public side, although most of work is done on thinking about private or public control of crime, policing and corrections and others. I wonder a little talk about, if you could talk a little bit about what, how you think about the problem and then, and then start to think about, talk a little bit about why, why it is that private inputs don't get so much attention in these kinds of discussions about crime control and crime prevention. So the conceptual development that I mostly put in or brought together in that 1986 uh, crime and justice paper was... Which, by the way, is underread and needs to be read more. It's awesome. I, I love that paper. Thank you, John. Yeah. And it has, uh, you know, what is, of course, natural for an economist is to, to think of, about the determination of a crime rate as uh, somehow the interaction of, uh, of uh, supply and demand. Uh, supply and demand of what, you, you might ask. And, and so that's when I decided that the object that we're um, analyzing should be criminal opportunity. It's not very well defined, but, but anyway, that, that is... Um, it's not the only theoretical framework where people haven't defined criminal opportunity very well. <laughs> and so at, at the time that I, I got into it, um, first of all, yes, there were other people that were talking about criminal opportunity in very different ways or in similar ways. The, the one who was talking about them in the most similar way was probably the Ron Clark with, with the situation of crime prevention. And his interest was in, for example, saying, you know, the amount of, of bus robberies is going to be influenced by whether you, you have a fare card system or a cash system on the bus. And if you replace the cash system with the fare card system, there's nothing to steal. That eliminates that as an attractive opportunity and the robbery rate will go to zero. And so this became, became a very practical uh, kind of guide to what could be done by public agencies and others and to uh, reduce certain kinds of, of crime. But what Clark did not do was to think about how to develop this in, into a theory of crime determination because he had opportunity as exogenous in, in the story for the most part or something that was being manipulated by the policymaker rather than something that was part of the process, this interactive process. And so what I think of as, as maybe my contribution was to say the supply of opportunities uh, is important in all the ways that Clark says it is, but the supply of opportunities is influenced by the threat of victimization. And so what you have is this interaction that determines the ultimate crime rate. And for example, the, one of the puzzles at the time I was writing was why are some of the most vulnerable uh, potential victims of robbery uh, experiencing the lowest robbery victimization rates? The classic case would be the little old lady living in the center city. Uh, and typically much lower robbery victimization rate than you would find for a young man living in the same area. Uh, and the answer is that the little old lady was responding to the threat of being robbed by staying at home. And so she protected herself, uh, limited the criminal opportunity that was represented by her. And so to understand the structure of crime rates, uh, in this case the demographic, demographic structure you had to take into account the interaction of the, the threat of victimization. You can go both ways. Uh, so that became um, kind of the, the basis of, of a larger story of saying let's think about what happens if you poke this system not only in terms of how criminals will respond but also in terms of how potential victims will respond and the new equilibrium will be the result of this interaction. So the, talk a little bit more about, so I think nowadays in economics of crime, when people think about economists studying crime, there's a real focus on um, 
fancy or sophisticated methods. It's really people doing natural experiments or uh, cl clever identification strategies for studying crime. And there really isn't much economics in that. But what you're talking about is real understanding of markets. Um, I, I, so and when you talk about this sort of equilibrium, talk a little bit more about um, some of the counterintuitive things that come out. One of the interesting things about economics, especially in thinking about markets, is some of the some of the theory produces counterintuitive results, mm -hmm. which is kind of the strength of it, right? If you didn't need the theory, if you could come up with everything on your own, you wouldn't need the theory to generate new insights. So what? So one of the you know. So if if for example, so this is like the safety belt kind of story that sometimes gets told with respect to car safety, but um, so if if things become sort of safer, then the, the part of the issue then is that people will respond. And so could you talk a little bit about the sort of dynamics of response and then also how that affects our ability to learn what's going on when we go to study it. Yeah, I, I think that the question is how important is that response, but absolutely the, the, the possibility is always there that if you do make things safer, then the uh, the, the result is going to be that the public that used to be very careful because of the threat of crime is now going to be more careless with the result that uh, there are going to be more and better opportunities available to the criminals and that will restore the crime rate. Um, there, there's long ago an article about the economics of the muggery, which was an attempt to, to think through this problem in the case of robbery, for example. And so you can imagine that if you have a very dangerous neighborhood uh, or, or city block in, in, in the city, uh, that there would be zero robberies just because everybody uh, is going to be so cautious that they don't go out at night. And, and so what you have is in this odd equilibrium uh, of uh, very low crime rate, and yet everybody understands it to be dangerous uh, just because uh, of the self-protective measures that, that are being taken that t take the form of abandoning the streets is what it comes down to. Uh, and then if that situation eases off and or for whatever reason people start showing up on the streets, then you're going to start seeing the robbery rate go up, uh, even though perhaps it is in response to uh, some greater measure of safety, like the police step up patrol in, in that block. And so that's the counterintuitive, perhaps, possibilities that, that come up. It, in terms of identifying uh, situations where that actually might happen, uh, that, you know, the, the one that I wrote about was the, this uh, problem of elderly women having such a low victimization rate. And I'm, I'm sure that there are a variety of things like, like that that could be done. But I, I think that this is always a, a fascinating idea. And, and your example, for example, that it, if we make vehicles safer, then drivers will respond by driving more intensely, uh, more aggressively, more recklessly, whatever it is, knowing that the consequences are less. Uh, then the result might be that a safer vehicle actually produces a higher crash rate and, and even the possibility of a higher injury rate uh, as uh, a result. So there's been a lot of fussing about this. Uh, occasionally we see examples where it is actually true that the reaction is so great to the change in the shock that it has this counterintuitive result. I, th I think one of the famous ones is when Finland uh, changed from left-hand side driving to right-hand side driving, what was it, the early 1950s. And so an incredibly intrinsically dangerous situation. Uh, and uh, the highway fatality rate went down during the first month following that changeover. And the 
analysis at the time was just that people are being so careful about how they're driving given um, this very unusual situation that they suddenly find themselves in, that they overcompensated <laughs> compared with what they were doing before. So uh, we are always open to that kind of thing, but I think the, the reality is that we get more of a partial adjustment than a full adjustment, right. and it's something we do. Well, and the partial adjustment would then make the parent change smaller than it would otherwise or otherwise should be because you're not accounting for the fact that people then change their behavior and response. And, and it raises hell for the evaluators right. because uh, the fact is that this compensatory behavior that, that leads to less of an effect than you might expect uh, is still in the public interest in many cases. I mean, it's a good thing for people to be out on the street at night. Uh, they can enjoy the city more. And so if you were going to evaluate the effect of the police patrol that made that possible, you would underestimate the benefit by just looking at the crime rate. Uh, but you also need to take into account the routine activities of people that, uh, in the neighborhood and how they're coming. I always wondered when I taught this, I uh, taught your paper a couple times in classes and in, in criminology departments for the economics of crime. And one of the stumbling blocks was that you end up with, the, if you're going to talk about the supply and demand for criminal opportunities, you end up thinking that the supply is provided by individuals who decide to commit crime. The demand is from individuals who take steps to avoid or not avoid crime, criminal opportunities. And so you end up with this strange idea of demand for criminal activity opportunities. And for some of my students, sometimes that was just really hard to get their heads around. Is there a different way of thinking about that? Or is that is sort of that just a hurdle you have to get over if you want to think about market for criminal opportunities? Uh, you know, it, it could be that we could develop a better uh, language, <laughs> coin a few new terms. It, it certainly was convenient to borrow that apparatus of supply and demand. Because it gives you this equilibrium. It, it, conceptually, yeah. yeah. You, you can talk about that. Um, and it is odd to think of the potential robber out there prowling around looking for potential victims as somebody who has a demand for a criminal opportunity. Um, and so I, I'm wide open to, <laughs> to other possibilities. I've always wondered about that. So, <laughs> So it isn't, as I mentioned, it, it is the case that, you know, you've always thought about this and, 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 and talked about these kinds of choices people make to, to control crime and how much of an impact that has on larger opportunities. And for example, I, I know from watching talk about this and thinking about why, for example, car thefts have gone down a lot, and a lot of that has nothing to do with what's going on in the public sphere, but as much as to do with security prevention techniques people have taken account of and have eventually been baked into cars, make, just making it harder to steal cars. Yeah. And, and that's a big part of the story and it has nothing to do with police or, or other parts. So w do you have any insight as to why this story of private inputs is not really made into the mainstream criminological studies in the same way? Is it is there any, is it just sort of a question of focus or um, do you have any thoughts as to why? Yeah, it just doesn't seem to be part. I know it's something you bring up a lot in an attempt to try to get people to think about it, but why do you, why do you think it doesn't catch on? Uh, and just to agree with you and take it a next step, uh, I, I would not be crazy to think that it doesn't come up in criminological circles, but real world people are very aware of it. And they, uh, but even there I found that, you know, when I talk to the city of New York about crime control, what they're thinking about is either the criminal justice system and how to deploy it, or the, they might be thinking about summer jobs programs or something like that. But not thinking about business improvement districts, uh, private security spending, how to coordinate with the um, who knows how many hundred thousand private security people that are uh, working in New York right now. Uh, how, how to uh, make that vast enterprise complementary to law enforcement uh, and, and uh, discipline it as well as possible. I mean, all of that seems to me like it would be the first thing 
mind if, if you were in the interest of making your city safer is that you're not alone. If you're in the mayor's office, you in fact have this, um, you know, every business person and, and really all of the residents uh, working in their own ways to be safer. And that if you could harness that in some way more efficiently than it is when everyone does their own thing, then possibly you could get a better result. Uh, so I don't have an answer to your question about why this has not caught on. It just seems like people have been trained to think in a particular way about crime, and uh, crime is the result of you know social background, or it's the result of, uh, of the law enforcement failure, uh, and yet. You know, as we go through our normal days, we're much more likely to see a private security guard than a, than a uniformed police officer. Uh, if we go shopping, we'll, we'll see all kinds of evidence about private activity to you know, prevent theft, and, and so on and so forth. It, it's our, our own efforts to lock up after we leave. Yeah, it seems, definitely seems like a, a policy opportunity. I, you know, from a research perspective, I know you've done some work with the business improvement districts that have shown that they're they're reasonably effective at reducing criminal um, uh, criminal victimizations. Um, do you see other research opportunities there in that in that space of thinking about the private investments? Uh, yeah, I did the work with John McDonald, uh, where we actually uh, were able to develop a. Um, you know, a, a kind of a cost-benefit analysis of the business improvement districts, and they are uh, really a bonanza for the public sector. You know, they don't cost anything to the city, and they are doing good work. Occasionally, but there's a scandal about them, but for the most part, they seem no no worse in terms of civil rights violations than you would get with the uh, police. Um, and we're doing now another project in New York City. Looking at the business improvement districts there, and, and so on. So, I, I, th I think there is a lot to uh, be learned, um, and the dose-response uh, patterns we're seeing are very persuasive. I think that there is a very big story out there that has not been told adequately, which is what difference has it made that. To a large extent, we don't use cash anymore in, in uh, our transactions, and the people carry less cash than they used to. Uh, you, you know, if, if you look at the long-term trend in uh, property crime, uh, that starting in at least 1980, there has been a, a downward trend uh, continuously. During, now it's a fifth of what it was then, or less. So we, we've gone through this kind of transformation in, in property crime, uh, one of the obvious culprits is the removal of cash from a lot of transactions, and yet there's been very little work that has been done on that. So there's been some work in, done, I think primarily in economics, about what happens when public, the provision of public, uh, public um, uh, welfare benefits or other benefits are no longer yes. cash and are no longer transferable and they're placed on uh, debit cards and mm -hmm. you can no longer sell, but for example, food stamps and stuff. And and that work has, I think, shown fairly clearly the kinds of ideas that you're that the crime drops right. um, by just so by simply taking out the cash element. Yeah. Um, and I believe there's some work in Sweden. People are starting to think a little bit about this because I think Sweden's one of the first economies that have gone largely cashless, cash. yeah. and it's affected things like um, drug markets. Uh, because the only people using cash are people doing illegal selling and mm -hmm. things like that, and especially if you get these interesting discussions about large sell, you know, these euro bills that are really big and and only get used for drug selling, right? And they always sure. have cocaine on them. Right, 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 right. right, right. <laughs> but it's I've seen a little bit of that from the in the economics of crime world, but not much else. Yeah. Yeah, and if the, if the big project in criminology is to explain crime trends, which I think is one of them anyway, uh, then you'd think that this would be way up there in the, in the So one of the interesting things about being at your fest trip was um, 
besides getting to see all these people, including my advisor, Dan Nagan, who knew you way back when, when he was a professor at Duke at the same time you were, mm -hmm. um, uh, share funny stories, was just seeing people talk about the different um, areas of your research, particularly with respect to alcohol, tobacco, and gambling, um, primarily state lotteries, um, where you know, the theme here is these are things that people like to do but could be harmful. And, and each of these areas has sort of specific characteristics of the discussion and the policy. And obviously alcohol is not the same thing as tobacco, it's the same thing as the lottery. But I wonder if it, for this discussion you could focus on sort of a th themes that sort of bring those areas, particularly the alcohol. It, you have work in, substantial work in each of those areas. But things that sort of, themes that bring that work together um, uh, that are common across each of the topics and, and that you could sort of um, sort of distill for us in your cookie and way um, that would help us understand sort of what you brought to and what you think you've learned from the study of those three discrete topics, alcohol use, tobacco, and, and gambling consumption. But I think that one contribution that I was able to make uh, did uh, derive from my training in economics and, and that mindset, which starts with the focus on the individual as somebody who makes choices. And the alternative is a, a more sociological uh, approach uh, that doesn't understand people to have discretion so much as to be acting out on uh, some program that is instilled by social structure uh, about their position in society, whatever it is. And, and the, the more sociological perspective uh, has the effect, rightly or wrongly, often of denying the potential influence of policy. And it says it's pointless, for example, to raise the uh, price of tobacco or of alcohol uh, because that's going to have no influence on, especially on the heavy users who are addicted and, and, uh, or who are committed to a particular uh, use pattern. Uh, and so that what we need to do is to look at in, in other areas, whether it's treatment or, or, or who knows what. Um, so it's, it's starting with an openness to the idea that people can respond and adapt even if they are quote unquote addicts or um, even if, if they're lifetime smokers or whatever the deal is. Uh, we shouldn't give up on the notion that demand curves slope down and, and that a higher price, if we could figure out how to put it on there, is going to make a difference. And so in, in um, especially in, in the alcohol area, uh, my best known work had to do with alcohol taxation and the discovery early on in 1982 that higher taxes uh, had a direct effect on the cirrhosis mortality rate which is an indicator of alcoholism, the prevalence of alcoholism for example. And then probably uh, closer to criminology was the 1984 paper also with George Token that looked at minimum drinking ages. And if you, again, if you looked at the literature at that time, and this was not by any means just criminologists, but also public health researchers, that uh, was always finding, you know, 20 ways to deny the possibility that law enforcement could matter or that regulation could matter. Uh, and the, in, the, in the case of underage drinking, it was pointing to the fact that you know, a majority of underage kids did drink, uh, at least in their late teens, um, and so obviously it wouldn't do any good to uh, have changed the age because it was so widely violated and, and then tell endless stories of, about how easy it is for kids to get alcohol. Uh, so my response to that with, with Talkin was to develop a um, what I, I think it was a very reliable method uh, for finding out what actually happened rather than to speculate about what would happen if you changed the drinking age. Looking at the first eight years of uh, 1970 to 1977 of that decade when a lot of states changed their age. 
uh, you know, on the very breaking age, and, and we were able to show that in fact there was a seven or eight percent reduction in highway fatalities for the kids. So that, in, in our mind, said that should be the new starting point for the conversation, which is, in fact, it does matter what the regulations are and what enforcement is. And now let's work backwards from that and figure out what the theory is. <laughs> but, but the old con concept uh, it was just fundamentally misleading. And, and that discussion was taking on a lot of its force by a particular understanding of human nature which denied the idea of agency and, and the ability of people to make choices and to adapt to incentives. Right. I guess I always, I, I love teaching economics and crime kind of classes and obviously use your work for that, but it's always, you get to these conversations about drug, you know, you know drug um, uh, control, illegal drug markets, and say, well, you know, obviously the war on drugs or, or illegal trying to mark uh, the banning of illegal drugs hasn't worked because anyone can get marijuana. and but Or anyone can get cocaine. But the price of cocaine is more, you know, it's higher than the price of gold, and it's flour. You know, at this point that that Phil, uh, Peter Reuter and others have made, essentially this is a cheap uh, agricultural product that we have made more expensive simply because of the regulations and making it illegal. Yeah. That that you know that's that that's that's not evident. The fact that you know some people still choose to do these things is not evidence that um, uh, it's not evidence that the regulation doesn't have an impact because there's lots of people that don't. Um, and, 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 and you have to think that through with respect to alcohol use or tobacco or whatever. And, but I also think that one of the insights you've had is, is that price elasticity, which is this important concept if you want to think about this. So, so when people say that people aren't responsive to price, they're saying they're inelastic with respect to price. Um, and yet, there's been important work showing that folks are in f are in fact elastic with respect to price, particularly certain types of with respect to drug consumption, alcohol consumption, tobacco use. A lot of it's done by the most serious users. The, the, it's a little bit like the crime thing that everyone says: five percent of all arrests, five percent of all crimes committed by fifty percent of all of the sorry, fifty percent of all crimes committed by five percent of the people. Well, the same thing with alcohol use. Most of the alcohol is consumed by and the, the claim would be that those folks are not sensitive to price, they're inelastic, and yet, if you think about heroin users or, or very serious alcohol users, they're, they're very elastic with respect to price because they don't have a lot of money left over and they're spending all of it on, if you spend all your money on heroin or alcohol, then you're very elastic with respect to price. Yes, you can actually do the math and say the elasticity is minus one. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, and how uh, well that works out, because it's often the heavy users that we're most concerned about. And that, I think, is probably partly why our intuition fails when we think about the effect of higher prices on alcohol consumption, is that we're thinking perhaps of our own modest consumption, but we were talking about someone who was by, uh, drinking two six packs a day and, and had very meager income. Then it's a different story. Could you talk a little bit about like and it, the same thing goes for like tobacco for young for it, it turns out tobacco use is very elastic for young people because they don't have infinite supply of money and yeah. and but there's very different policies right now with respect to taxes on alcohol versus taxes on um, tobacco. Um, and, and that's something that you were one of the first person that brought to my attention. Could you talk a little bit about that and just to then talk about the policy environment that's created that situation just from your perspective? Yeah, I, I, th I think that there's never been a clearer event study than the Master Settlement Agreement in 1998, which uh, where the, the, the uh, manufacturers of tobacco products in the U.S. agreed to settle a lawsuit by the attorneys general uh, and by making a number of concessions. And, and one of the concessions turned out to be that, that those tobacco companies would stop lobbying. So instead of uh, pressuring legislatures across the country and the U.S. Congress to keep taxes low, among other things, 
they simply withdrew from that political playing field, decided that instead they would focus on exporting to foreign countries. Uh, and the legislatures immediately jumped in and started raising taxes because it was no longer a political price to pay. And Congress raised taxes several times. And so we went from a, a situation where the, there had been a very low tax to a situation now where a pack of cigarettes is uh, typically over $5, largely because of the state, uh, even local and, and certainly federal taxes. Meanwhile, uh, the alcohol industry and the, the alcohol distributors particularly have definitely not withdrawn from the political playing field. Uh, and the latest tax proposal coming out of Congress, for example, reduces excise taxes. And, uh, this has been a high priority for the big uh, alcohol manufacturers and, and distributors uh, since 1991 at least, when Congress doubled the tax. Uh, and you know, the state legislatures have wimped out in the face of this kind of pressure. So at that, I think, rather than a difference in the evidence on the effectiveness of these taxes has been the whole story. It, it is just what is the political price that the industry is going to make them pay in, the, in that change. And in fact, the, it is evident, you know, if you want evidence-based policy, well, the evidence uh, on that, that higher taxes reduces smoking is of exactly the same sort as the evidence that higher taxes reduces alcohol abuse. And it's just as more or less persuasive. So you never, so I've always, I've always wanted to ask you this, and I, I but feel free to, you know, punt it back or, or um, but to me that discussion about alcohol and tobacco use is not that different than the discussion about the terms that you had in the 1979 paper. Um, and this issue about whether some people may not be deterrable. It's something that Michael Tonnery has brought up over time and, it, and it's the criticism often of the economics of, of punishment kinds of arguments. Is there a parallel between the, 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 the story about deterrence and, 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 and whether deterrence works or not um, and, and these markets for illegal goods where the sanctions are, are not so much you know, go to prison but rather price-based in terms of taxes? Do you see a connection? Um, is, is it basically the same story that large numbers of people are very responsive and others are not? Or, or, or how, how do you think about that? And is that something you're willing to make a connection? That I, if I'm willing to make a jump, are you willing to? <laughs> yeah, oh no, I, in fact I, I did that a bit in my talk at the Fesher. I, yeah. I think there is a direct connection and again it, it is, if, if you start with the idea that people uh, make choices and are adaptable, to the incentives of the environment that faces it, um, then that opens your mind to the possibility of deterrence. Uh, it doesn't end the conversation. You have to do the empirical work, and what you might find is that there are particular people in particular circumstances in, in which no, uh, no matter how harsh the, the threat, that, that it would not change the behavior. But that's by and large not what's going on. and, and uh, I think not much more often, it is, um, you, you know, sort of modestly motivated people making choices that could be influenced if they had a vivid example in mind with some friend of theirs who, who had been arrested and punished, but that would really, really matter. So, before I think we should take a, a quick break, but just, uh, um, the, uh, is there something that, you know, to the extent to which your work on markets, um, drug markets, gambling markets, um, tobacco, is not sort of mainstream criminological, um, but there are criminologists and criminological theories about these kinds of things. Is there something that you think, other than the, the idea of markets themselves and the study of the, the sort of classic application of markets that distinguishes your work from them? Is there things that could be learned from the criminologist side um, to, to the more economic application of these ideas? What do you think about Kit Carpenter's work or other work like that where it's just sort of looking at the response margins or, or, or vice versa that you could broaden the discussion in criminology? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the evidence that's been established about responsiveness to, to uh, price to minimum age uh, is so strong that, as I said, it, for those who are interested in understanding the mechanisms and the conceptual process, that that's a good place to start. And I think we would end up with a different story. Now, you might bring to it a sociological lens or, or something else, but it doesn't have to be necessarily the, the, the kind of sparse story that economists tend to tell about that. But I, I think that somehow the story has to end up with responsiveness because that's life as we know it. That's been established. Uh, and I, I don't see that that is, is necessarily uh, happening. Uh, but it strikes me as a good practice. Now, there are other issues, of course, which is, uh, you know, some cost to raising the prices. Is that really what we want to do? There's definitely a cost to raising the minimum drinking age. There's been an enormous cost to cracking down on uh, uh, illicit drug use and, and uh, that, uh, it seems to me, is fair game. So if you're doing the policy analysis, then you want to be comprehensive and think about the costs and benefits. But again, with the idea that it, it to some extent, is a mechanism that works. So um, probably the, you know, it's, it's funny for me because uh, I know you work because of employment and crime. And um, my dissertation also was on the relationship between employment and crime. And of course, you were, you were the first person that Dan Nagan told me to, to look up. <laughs> and your paper was the first paper I read as a second or third year grad student on uh, the relationship between unemployment and crime. Um, so that's my entry point into your work. But it's it, it, your work in that area has been largely overshadowed by the Cantor and Land kind of arguments about um, business cycles and crime. Um, and most people in criminology, when they, when they talk about Phil Cook, think about your work on guns. Um, and, and I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about how you got into studying guns, um, uh, how you view uh, your work on guns in this context, also how you view your interactions with criminologists, which a lot of your interactions have been around, uh, around guns. Um, I think I, at one part I heard that there may actually be a course dedicated to your, to your work in, <laughs> in criminology departments, yes. <laughs> in, 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 in the criminology department. Uh, so I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about how you got into it and, and, and what, you, what you think your contributions are. And, just, and this is a place where I think the, the, the lens of criminology versus economics and your sort of interactions with criminologists would be most interesting to hear about. It. Yeah, um, sure, I'm glad to do that. Uh, so, um, as I said, you know, I moved to Duke and started uh, teaching a, the administration of justice. Uh, um, I was turning my dissertation into a couple of papers and, and so forth, and possibly including the one you, you uh, read. Uh, and I got a call from Wesley Skogan, uh, who was at uh, the predecessor to NIJ at, at that point, uh, 1974 perhaps. Uh, but he had his hands on the early data from the pilot studies on, that became the National Crime Victimization Survey. So he, what he was doing was inviting a few people to, to write whatever paper they wanted to uh, using these unique data. And, and it was surveys that had been done in a number of cities as a, as a pilot to what became the National Survey. Um, and so I had access to, the, for the first time, to reports by uh, victims that showed up in the survey uh, about, uh, in particular, their being robbed, and um, then some of the details about the robbery and, and how it came out in terms of whether they were injured or not, and, and whether the, the robbery was successful in, in terms of theft. Uh, and then the victim's description of how many robbers there were, what weapons they had. You know, this is a very detailed uh, account of the process. 
uh, and so it, it occurred to me as a good economist that I should be interested in the technology of this enterprise uh, and so that this was for the first time data that would allow me to really look at that um, and I, I'm not sure exactly where that idea came from but it, it seemed like an obvious thing to do um, given the nature of the data and in fact you know that's where I discovered the kinds of influences that having a gun present made in, in uh, the context of robbery. Uh, well, that became front and center in, in the paper that I wrote for uh, Wes Gogan. But that made me uh, the second leading world's expert on gun, con <laughs> gun research. Uh, the first one being Frank Zimmering, who had started the field just a few years earlier. So Frank, as you know, published his very first paper in 1968. And in fact, that was uh, the first paper, as far as I know, ever published that was a systematic inquiry into gun violence and, and the role of the weapon type. Uh, so we have a field that is now booming hundreds of publications every year that had exactly zero prior to 1968. And Frank published a couple of papers. He said at the time, he told me he expected that he was going to be the leader of this big parade, but nobody showed up. <laughs> and so it didn't catch on. And, and then when I wrote my paper, um, then that added me to the list pretty soon. Borgia and Kleck uh, joined in, and in 1980, uh, the public health people started looking at it, uh, and so forth. Mark Moore came in at, at some point. So that that was a sort of an account of how I got into it, but the point was that once I was in, then it put me in touch in, in, with everyone else in the world who was working on this, Main, mainly Frank, but <laughs> uh, the, uh, and then Mark Moore. Uh, and so that we got involved in um, a project together, Mark and I did, you know, that long way that had a grant uh, funding and, and uh, the rest is history. So the, um, so do you talk a little bit about, I've always, <laughs> it's such a hot topic. I've always, in terms of like when I said how I made heated, people get um, very anxious, very upset and very heated about this. And you've always had sort of a bemused, as you enter into this world, you've always had a little bit of bemused expression on your face where you're just trying to figure it out. You, you seem very balanced in a way. But I just talk a little bit about what it's like to do research in an area that generates this much heat um, and, and how you've sort of dealt with that and how do you think about that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there is uh, endless sensitivity and, and it's, it's hard to say anything that, that isn't going to really irritate someone. Except that it is not symmetric. Uh, so it, the context for people like myself who are writing in this area is the, the group that is really mo mobilized to respond to anything published uh, is uh, on the pro-gun side. I, I find it very irritating that they are called pro-gun rights uh, since I, I think of myself as pro-gun rights, but anyway. Uh, so we'll call them the pro-gun people. Uh, Did you grow up with guns on the farm? Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, everybody had a gun. My neighborhood, including me. Um, I just had BB guns. Another generation later. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so that was... Um, one, one feature of this is that there was this extraordinarily committed and mobilized group of uh, people, not very large, but um, to some extent organized through the National Rifle Association, uh, but also just... But they became more organized later, right? More in the 90s, right? Didn't really become as organized. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I think they became more intense uh, as time went on. But, uh, and so I had the experience uh, uh, for example, of publishing uh, with Jens Ludwig the evaluation of the Brady Act, 
the, the Brady Act of 1994, where we found that this uh, crowning achievement of the uh, gun safety movement, uh, in fact, had not reduced suicides or homicides, as far as we could tell. Uh, and so it, it was certainly true that uh, the, the pro-safety uh, side saw me as uh, a real problem and, and that if they thought of me as a friend up until that point as having stabbed them in the back. But there wasn't the, the kind of vitriol that I would get routinely if, if I wrote anything that, that seemed to favor the other side. And so that's, that's the asymmetry of, of this world. It is also true that if um, you're in the business of writing books, which I've done several times, that, that to sell those books, it's very important that you be pro-gun rather than pro-safety, because it's the pro-gunners that buy the books. Uh, so that's a, a tip for anyone that's actually looking to make money on this. Anyway, the, the good news is that it meant that whatever I wrote, somebody would read it. And for a lot of us academics, the most important thing is that if you put it out there, you, you hope to hell someone somewhere is actually going to read it. Well, that you can guarantee if it has to do with gun violence. So like a, this is interesting that you bring this sort of up. And I don't think this is true across all social science disciplines, but at least in policy and economics, there's this notion of sort of that, uh, that there's a role for a researcher who's just going to try to ask the question and answer it without taking a side. Um, and I've always viewed, I, 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 and I was trained in such a way that that was like sanctimonious, like you have to be that yeah. way. Yeah. But that's not necessarily always the case for all, all social scientists. And I wonder what your take on that is. Are you comfortable sort of not picking a side per se? Are you, um, I, how do you respond when, I've had this happen to me where I, People thought I was on their side, and then I get a result that doesn't quite favor their position, and they get upset about it. Um, and, and so, how does that, how do you feel about how do you how do you get comfortable in that space where you're not necessarily on a side, and your job is to provide information for the discussion? Yeah, it, it, it's a great topic, uh, and and we could talk a long time about it. I, I think if if I understand what Chuck Vansky's position is on the uh, and uh, I have great admiration for him, it, it is that the only reason why the public should pay any attention to science and scientists is because they are dedicated to the truth rather than to grinding some acts. And that it's in order to preserve that special standing he imagines that we have or can have, that we have to be very pure on, on this issue and call it exactly the way we see it or, or the way our best efforts uh, would incline us to see it. Um, and I, I think that there's certainly a lot of truth to that. I would add that I can split to some extent, the, that I have my science hat when I'm publishing in scientific journals, and I like to think that there uh, I am neutral and uh, as possible, and, and uh, that I, I really do uh, tell the full story uh, as I understand it, but that I can also have an opinion as a citizen, and so that the opinion can influence how I vote, or it can influence who I send contributions to, or um, uh, even what advocacy groups uh, um, I, I might be working with. So that's. Um, the kind of balance in, in this area that I would like to believe that I, I can pursue. But I, I think the bigger thing and what keeps me uh, going is that I think the one part of this that is rock solid uh, in the gun violence area is, is just the idea that it's important that it really is having a big negative effect on our standard uh, in, of living in, in the particular neighborhoods that are highly impacted by gun violence and are distressed as a result that it's a block to economic development and, and well-being. 
that, that deserves our best efforts. So saying then, the, the search is for policies that work. And I, I think that that open-minded search for what works may, means that it's just as important to find out what doesn't work as to find out what does work and to announce it. How do you try. deal with the stress of the attacks and the, uh, how, does that, how do you handle that personally? Is it a problem or is it something you can just sort of let go or is it? I, I tell my resident clinical psychologist about it sometimes. <laughs> so <laughs> Judy hears about the latest anonymous phone message I got or whatever it is. And, um, uh, sometimes not so anonymous. And, um, but the form the attack always takes, it seems like, which is kind of peculiar, is to just uh, say, in effect, that I'm corrupt, that I'm not a scholar, that I'm not the Mansky scientist who, who is calling it the way my science leads me to call it, but rather that I'm committed to a particular point of view uh, and that I'm just faking it with the science. And so that uh, is so widely uh, shared of the, the theme of, of, of these attacks that um, I'm, I'm kind of curious in, about, about uh, who, who's calling the shots on, on this. But it hurts. I will say that. I mean, it, it's getting me exactly where I live. Right. Because it's the one thing that you think about is the central part of your identity. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I get it. I have the same sort of response. More limited stuff. Uh -huh. yeah. I don't quite get into the gun stuff. I'm not sure I can handle the heat, actually. But yeah. um, the what do you? This is an area, like I said, that you have interacted with criminologists a lot. So do you have any insight? Is and I know you said some of it's been constructive, some of it hasn't. When I talked to you about this outside of this conversation, what is your take on the criminological approach to the study of guns, and how does it complement your own work? And how do, where do you think this work could go in the future? Um, and perhaps both, you know, I think this is an area where, you know, you have the economic element, but you have a broader scope of presentation. You know, what's the interaction between the way you approach it in criminology and what do you think some of the future opportunities are in this area? Yeah, but um, I, I guess the first thing I would say is that, especially since 2014 and with Obama's leadership in the area, that the field has exploded. And there is uh, a much more robust flow of papers coming from uh, social science departments, business schools, uh, certainly public health schools, uh, and our public policy schools. Uh, it's, a, it's a discontinuity, and the amount of refereeing I'm being asked to do is just completely uh, different than it was uh, before. So. Uh, the good news is there's a lot of work being done despite the fact that there's no federal funding. Uh, the uh, maybe bad news is that the criminologists are not playing much of a role. And I, I think it's much more the public health, economics, uh, are, are the ones that I'm talking to, public policy. But there is some, and um, that the ASC has chosen to honor, for uh, example, uh, Gary Kleck's work, uh, and, and Gary, I think, is by far the most prominent criminologist who has worked in this area. Uh, and he comes out of the sociological tradition, he's a sociologist, and, and which is to say that he um, doesn't think that government matters much, that regulation doesn't matter, uh, and that he writes from that perspective about the futility of, of trying to do work in this area. So that, I think, resonates with the, what I, it remains the core of criminality. So I, um, uh, I did this part out. I, so I had wanted to talk to you a little bit about the winner take all, but we're running out of time, uh, uh, and I don't know where, where there is, you'd rather talk about, so there's the opportunity at the end to sort of reflect on broader themes about your contribution and your career, or we could talk a little bit about, what would you rather, given the trade-off, what would you rather talk about? Oh, uh, well, I, I think it would be 
probably be useful to talk about my relationship to criminality. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm glad to talk about winner take all. Oh, I just think winner take all is really cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Winner take all is probably your best known work outside of criminology, and it's extremely well known. Um, and and I and I think it'd be fun for people in criminology to know a little bit about it, and also have your reflections on how it this this type of thinking might affect, or these type of markets might affect uh, the criminological context. And so why don't you briefly talk to us, to tell us a little bit about what Winner Take All was. It's now 20 years old. I love the book. I think it's great. Uh, people should read it if they haven't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but if you can talk a little bit about it and, and maybe reflect it back to criminology to, 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 to the extent to which it has implications there. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Ed. It was published in 1995. Uh, the with uh, Robert Frank, another wow. economist uh, who wow. I actually went to graduate school with. And uh, its ultimate origin was uh, the answer to the question of how can we spend more time together, because we're very good friends. And the answer was to write this book. Um, the original insight was that as I was walking around the Duke campus in around 1990, I noticed Duke students were wearing t-shirts that said Duke on them. And I, that struck me as very odd. Certainly when I was an undergraduate, no one would wear a t-shirt that said Michigan on it, uh, except the alumni who were coming back to campus. But if you were there, then you wouldn't do that. Um, and what I realized is how things had changed in between, which is that the uh, top schools, the elite schools like Duke and, and Michigan had actually become much more selective, much more elite, uh, much more of the 1%, uh, maybe not just on income, but on uh, academic achievement, um, and decided that it would be useful to explore that dynamic and why, that it, why the students had sorted themselves out in a way that simply wasn't true. 20, 30 years uh, earlier, and the answer had to do partly with the, the fact that the market for elite higher education had become a national market because transportation costs and, and communication costs had come way down for one thing, and families were smaller, so families could afford to send their kids, and so on and so forth. Um, so we, we wrote an article docu documenting this amazing change in higher education and how the top students were now going to the elite schools, whereas before they were going to their local schools. Um, and that we had this increasing separation and concentration of the very best. Uh, and then Bob and I started talking about it and said, you know, this relates to a much larger phenomenon of the increasing inequality of income that was uh, noteworthy since the uh, early 1970s in the US. And so we wrote the book um, about what are the underlying factors that account for that increasing inequality, uh, technological change, changes in institutions, and, and so forth. And somewhere along the line, Bob hit on this terrific title of the Winner Take All Society. Uh, and that then became a routine part of President Clinton's speeches, and, and you know, it, it caught fire. At the sense, but but the, the analysis I, I must say was also uh, pretty uh, pretty interesting and, and I think pushed the ball forward. Uh, since then, others have stepped in, of course, uh, because the unfortunately the increasing inequality of income is just a continuing fact of our life at, uh, on this globe. Um, it's gotten much worse since the time we wrote about it. And all of the factors that we talked about have intensified uh, since then. So it has uh, kind of the quality of an early statement that actually looked at this not as something that was somebody's fault, but more that it was part of this underlying uh, technological change. And that then also turned to the question about what differences it make and, and make a strong statement. Does it have anything to do with criminology and crime? Well, I, I think that um, the, the, certainly the increasing inequality of income 
seems like it should have a, a big effect on crime. Uh, and we hear today that some of the aspects of that, and especially the stagnation in the middle and the lower middle, that has been part of that, and the increasing concentration at the top, gets part of the blame for this huge ramp up in uh, drug overdose deaths in, in this country. So I, I think the fact of blocked opportunity, the uh, simply fewer good opportunities um, that have led to despair and self-destructive behavior, including the overuse of illicit drugs that might be seen as part of a tie-in. At first, it occurred to me that this was important when um, Bob and I were being interviewed by Paul Solomon for the news hour of, uh, of PBS. And, um, you know, we had a delightful day with Paul Solomon, who's a funny guy, and, and enjoyed uh, being part of that. Uh, and afterwards, I realized that the cameraman who had been with us all day was, looked like he was about to cry. And I asked him, you know, what's going on? And he said, uh, well, he'd been listening. And he realized that his kids had very little chance in this world, based on what we were saying. Uh, and that took me off my high horse in a moment uh, you know, to realize Oh yeah, yeah, we're talking about real people. And that's, that's exactly. and that's interesting when you start to think about like the racial inequalities and investments that it's not always, the, I mean, it is the case that the improvements have been going up in terms of educational attainment for everyone, but then there's this group at the top who just get so much more resources and so much more investment and continue to grow at such a high level that the differences can can emerge out of that. It's, oh, yeah. it's, not, it's not that one group isn't, folks at the bottom aren't improving, it's, it's the, the folks at the top are improving at a much higher rate. Yeah, although the folks at the bottom probably aren't improving. <laughs> well, well, recently there's some, some evidence <laughs> to suggest that's not, that's yeah. not going up as much. Yeah, no, no. But they, um, you know, I, I think that there is this question for about, you know, is, is increasing inequality going to influence crime rates otherwise? Uh, probably has a big effect on white collar crime rates. Um, as the scramble at the top, I think, is getting more and more intense for people going after the very large pots of money that are available. But it's not so clear about what's going on just generally with street crime and that kind of, you know, we have uh, this puzzle at, at the one hand that if you look in any one point in time, uh, poor neighborhoods have higher crime rates than wealthier neighborhoods on average, or less educated have higher crime rates than more, and so on. So the cross section always suggests that um, you know more is better when it, it comes to criminal involvement. Um, on the other hand, if, if we look at how crime rates have changed over time, it's very hard to find an influence on increasing inequality, and so. You know, the crime rates peaked in 1993 in, in violent crime, and, and 1980 was the, the peak for property crime, but it be coming down until very recently. And that's been a time of great increases in inequality. So, yeah, it's interesting that you had to explain that. It's sort of yeah. a, a fun, interesting thing. One of the things I um, stumbled upon a few years ago that I hadn't fully appreciated was that, um, and that most probably criminologists uh, don't know, and maybe I shouldn't tell them, is that you were the first person way back in 1979 to suggest that the future of economics, the, study, the economists to the study of crime didn't have much to do with economics, but rather in the study of um, uh, identifying uh, and then studying uh, natural experiments or changes in policies that might occur in some place and not others that would give you some, some some idea about the responsiveness of, or the effectiveness of these interventions on behavior without necessarily giving us so much knowledge about the underlying mechanism. And that you didn't have much hope for thinking about the mechanism, which would be the economics. But that you really thought that this, just studying the response of, of, of behaviors to shocks was really the way forward. Um, and you said that in 1979, 
and that's another way of saying instrumental variables and natural experiments, and you did a little bit of work on this area. And then nothing really happened until 1996 or so when this guy named Steve Levitt showed up and started doing these instrumental variable things. And now there's a huge growth of economists, which criminologists may or may not be aware of, who now study crime. And you run a, a seminar at, at, um, at, at every summer and workshop in, in, in Boston that you started in 2010 that you know, now attracts hundreds literally hundreds of economists. There was a dinner we went to together that with 55 graduate students who were interested in the study of economics and crime. There's a huge growing area that largely centers on this idea of bringing natural experiments to the study of crime. I wonder if you could reflect a little bit about um, so your role in creating that, how you feel about it, uh, and what do you think the future of that, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the relationship of this really large and growing group of, of economists who are studying crime and their relationship to criminology or lack thereof. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, good, good topic. Um, you know, of course, the brief history of uh, empirical work in, in economics of crime in the 1970s is that Isaac Ehrlich and several others published big complicated econometric studies of, of crime in 1973 uh, and got a lot of attention at the time um, they were using state-of-the-art methods at that time. and, and uh, the National uh, Academies put together an expert panel chaired by uh, Al Blumstein and, and with Daniel Negan as a staff person on there to review that uh, new empirical research, uh, and their conclusion was very negative. But uh, said that you know, given the identification uh, procedures that was being used, it was not persuasive, and that really deflated the field. It, 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 at that point, was looking for new methods because uh, standard regression analysis was not going to do it. Um, it, for entirely separate reasons, I got involved. Uh, in a, a couple of projects involving alcohol control, where we were, George Talkin and I were the, the very first to uh, implement the diff and diff method using panel regression uh, on policy changes. So the first one was on changes in liquor taxes uh, in 1982, and then in 1984 it was the first panel regression study of changes in the minimum drinking age, uh, and hence the contribution to criminology. And of course, since then, as, as you say, these kind of quasi-experimental panel regression, diff and diff methods have become overwhelmingly popular in economics and in other fields, as have other quasi-experimental methods uh, in the effort to nail down causality in a, in a more persuasive way. Uh, you know, I think that that was a big contribution. That is how empirical economists define themselves these days. You know, if you talk to someone like Jens Ludwig and you say, what does it mean to be an economist? If, if he would, I think, start by saying it's someone who understands identification. Uh, and at that point, you can go anywhere uh, in all of the social sciences. The criminologists I think are more out in front on uh, running field experiments, which is the other thing. I mean, there's always the gold standard in the higher level to do it. So there's more uh, of that. Uh, but I, I think that that also, uh, is, that's the alternative track to producing persuasive causal estimates. Uh, and there should be a room to, to bring the two sides together. Uh, I don't want to close without you talk, talking about your mentoring. You just mentioned what Jens Ludwig, and it's probably, um, uh, you know, he, he's, you, you, you have, you, because you were at a policy school, you didn't have a ton of students who studied crime, uh, but you had, um, but you did have Jens. <laughs> and uh, it, it's a pretty impressive uh, achievement to have a student of that who's now achieved the kinds of things he's, he's achieved. And you've also, in my experience, always been incredibly uh, warm and welcoming for grad students and mentoring, and certainly were with me. Um, in fact, I remember this conversation we had um, in Al Bloomstein's backyard in the first year of cover, and, right. and you encouraged me to actually think that I could have a career as a someone who had an economics background 
but nonetheless was going to be in a criminology environment. Yeah. Um, just yeah. what what is what is the role of mentoring been for you, and and how does what is your how have you uh, th thought about that as you had your career, um, given, you know, particularly given that you've been so instrumental for so many people. Yeah, thanks, and, and I'm really glad that I could be helpful to uh, to you. And uh, that backyard conversation probably involved a beer or two. I don't think I remember that. But I didn't have one, but you might have. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> okay. Yeah. I was I was probably a little too intense. I think I talked your ear off for about two hours, but it was really helpful for me as I tried to think about how I could have a career. Yeah, and you know, I I, I think the first thing you said is it's always been my favorite part of teaching is working one-on-one -on -one with students as they begin their research careers or at some point in their research career. Uh, and, I, you know, it, it, it ends up, I think, being a coaching function uh, in the sense that you're, you're out there on the playing field, you're actually doing it, and the coach can make some adjustments of, of, along in real time um, uh, as the student kind of tries out different things and you know I, I think what I focus on is I'm sure you do too um, and you, uh, would, would be to be very clear about what the question is to be very clear about what data are available then to revisit what the question is after you figure out what data are available and say we have a different question which is what question can we actually answer given the data that we have and then um, this kind of unwritten uh, task, which is to help the students develop intuition about numbers and, and about the results of getting out of the computer. And to say, you know, if you get a really wacky result, it's not because you've made a major new discovery, it, it's because you made a programming error. Yeah, and that lesson, I think, is maybe the most important one that <laughs> given to you. Uh, to some of the students. And the other thing is just presentation and marketing. You know, it's how, how do you get your ideas in a form that is going to sell? Which you do extremely well. Mm -hmm. I, this last thing, I just, is there anything I, you know, haven't asked you about or that you, that, that you would like to share or uh, thoughts you had that I haven't been able to get to? Um, uh, you know, I, I think there's one more topic that I take some pride in, which is uh, the two projects that I did to estimate the cost of the death penalty. And what I, there was no rocket science in, involved. They, they were um, challenging in, in their own way. Uh, but I, th I think to add conceptual clarity and, and to get some believable numbers in that area actually turned out to be helpful in terms of what is obviously a very prominent public debate over what we should do, and, and in particular to document that we are not saving money by executing people. That seemed to be the bottom line that was policy relevant for people who are wondering which side of the fence to come down on in, in this area. Uh, so it was an opportunity f that anybody could have pursued who had some time and, and, um, and initiative didn't, didn't, as I say, require fancy methods or anything like that, but um, just conceptual clarity and uh, realizing that, that this was, answering this question turned out to have some leverage in, in the debate. Yeah, yeah that, the, the um, so you've, you've done so much work on so many different important policy questions and the clarity that you bring to the question is often the, the main contribution, which, which has always been something that I've taken away from my interaction with you and always uh, tried, <laughs> failed probably to do it the same way, but it's, it, it is a, it's an important lesson and it's certainly, I, I think you really made clear to a lot of people who've had a lot, who've been fortunate to interact with you. Uh, so, well, I, thank you. That makes me feel good. Yeah, that's no, pretty cool.